is going to be talking, uh, Elliot's from Google, and Elliot will be talking about web components in Google Chrome, and works on the rendering engine. So uh, I think we're ready to go. Let's uh, have a big round of applause for Elliot Sprain. Hey. Uh, I'm Elliot Sprain, and I work on Chrome. Uh, that's my email address. If you have had a problem in Chrome, you should send me an email and we will fix it because we care very passionately about web developers. Uh, I focus on the web platform, specifically bringing new APIs like the web audio API we saw yesterday uh, and other crazy things so that we can have like really amazing stuff like Atom. Uh, my slide deck is made of HTML. This used to be like really cool and then someone went and built a whole text editor and things like my slide deck aren't very cool anymore. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about let's, how do we use the web today? And in particular, you say you want to build an application and you say, I need a widget. And we're going to first talk about something that no one actually does. They think, I have this great idea. I'm going to go, I'm going to add this feature to the browser. I need like a new drop down or something cool. And I'm going to go actually get it added to the browser. And the first thing you're going to do is send a bunch of emails. And then you're going to argue, and I'm sad that I don't have the like uh, Node.js common thread because that would have been perfect here. But that's my life actually, is I live in those arguments all the time. And no one actually wants to do that. And then, let's say you get consensus, finally the browsers say they're going to do it. Well, years are going to go by before it actually happens. And then your project is canceled because it took you three years to add your dropdown. And so no one actually does this. Instead what they do, because like, that just doesn't work. You're like, no, I'm not even going to try. Uh, instead, you say, I want to make a widget. I need this new dropdown. First thing you do is you're going to add a lot of divs to the page. There was a time in the web when we used to use like, different kinds of markup, but if you like, look at the inside of most web apps, it's like divs all the way down. Even the turtles are gone. It's just divs. And then you say, I need some style. And you're like, OK, well, I have this really big style sheet and I'm going to put more stuff in the really big style sheet. And you say, oh, okay, so it's now about 5,000 lines. It's like typical for an application. And then you say, oh, yeah, so I need some event listeners. And you like hook up a bunch of random event listeners. And you're like, oh, it's probably going to work. It might work. Uh, this is sort of how I feel when we build applications today. You like take your computer and you take it into a dark corner and you convince it to do what you want. And then you like hope that it actually happened. And we don't want to be uh, developing for the web to be like that. Developing for the web should be a joy, and you should expect it to work when you write your code. So you say, I'm going to use a framework, because no one really wants to write on like, the bare metal of the web. That'll solve my widget problem. There's probably like a React widget for this. So you say, OK, we'll use React for this application. But then you work on another project, and then you're using Angular, and then maybe Polymer, and maybe Ember, and like some other framework that just came out last week that like replaced all these frameworks. And you have this problem, none of your widgets are compatible with any of your other applications. So we rebuild the same widget over and over again. There's 10 different dropdowns for every framework. And we don't reuse any code between them. And that's like kind of a dysfunctional ecosystem where every framework feels compelled to like rebuild every widget. So we say, well, what is the framework that everybody uses? Well, it's just the web platform itself. Everyone knows how to use an input. Everyone knows how to use a select. And every framework understands those. So what if you could just build your own input so every framework could use one of those? And that's what the new extensible web platform is about. It's about bringing the power of building applications just like the browser does. So what exactly is an input? An input is a declarative API, a JavaScript API, and some special rendering. So what, what do you need to do that yourself? So here's, here's an example of an input. Uh, it's the number input with these cute little steppers that you'll notice don't scale when I scale the font size. That's a Chrome bug. Uh, oh, we can zoom in because we're in the future. So see these little steppers? Where did they come from? Because if you look in your browser, there's no divs in there. It's just like an input, and magically there's these little steppers. And these are the new tools. You have custom elements, you have shadow DOM, you have templates, and you have imports. And I think Adam uses about three of those, maybe? I don't know if he uses templates. I hope he uses templates. Let's start with custom elements. Custom elements allow you to register your own tag names. 
Now when you create your new widget, you just define a tag and then you get these great callbacks. You get a callback when you're inserted into the document. That allows you to do your setup. You get a callback when you're removed from the document. That allows you to do teardown. And this will be compatible with any framework. And you also get an attribute change callback because the interface of the web platform is actually just attributes. You, like you set attributes in your markup and it just works. So the couple things to know. First, it has to contain a dash. If you look at the code that makes up Atom, you'll see that there's like dashes everywhere. Uh, this, this is the reason why you need to put dashes because it lets you like namespace your elements. You get like Atom dash and editor dash. Uh, it also has to inherit from HTML element or SVG element if that's what you're doing. Uh, and you only get one per class. Uh, fun trivia, all the heading elements on the web, H1 to H6, are the same class. They are all HTML heading element. Uh, for some reason, they just have different tag names and this is very confusing and so we've decided this was a mistake and we've fixed it for you when you are building your own widgets and you get class affinity. So every class gets one tag name. So now you have your custom element but you need some kind of internals to it. Somehow I need to add those little steppers. And that's where Shadow DOM comes in. Shadow DOM allows you to put something inside your widget. So if we go back to this input type number, where is this? And we're going to do a live demo here and bring up the web inspector right on stage. But if you look inside this input type number, you'll see there really is a bunch of divs. In fact, your browser implements its widgets just like you would, except you can't see them because they're hidden inside the widget. So here you can see there's the little steppers and this is the editor that I type into. And Shadow DOM allows you to build this. It allows you to fully encapsulate your widget. And this comes with uh, an expectation of it actually working because now your styles live inside, your JavaScript can be bundled with it, you have like a private space to like put your elements and not worry about jQuery going down there and being like, I know what this div is, I'm going to turn this div into a button. And like, no, it is not a button and you like have to convince the framework not to do those things. The Shadow DOM has no accidental access and that's the feature, but you can still traverse through the page. You can crawl down into the Shadow DOM if you need to. It's still very hackable. You can still use selectors to like style things down there, but it has a principle of least surprise. Usually when you write your code, it remains very modular. And here's a sample application. This is sort of like an email, client, chat, something or other um, about my presentation. And you see there's like a bunch of widgets in it. And historically, if you looked at this in your editor for this application, you'd see that it was just like, stuff everywhere. But this is what it should look like in the future. You should see like really beautiful declarative markup that looks exactly like you'd envision the application to look. It has an application and a toolbar and some buttons and somehow it all lays out and it, it works. And that's where Shadow DOM has this composition feature. Composition says, take my children and let's place them somewhere. Here, the toolbar says, I accept buttons and I accept menus. And the menus go to one side and the buttons go to the other side. If we go back and we look at the application, we can see there's uh, two buttons on one side and then there's a little menu. And we call that the content model. And this is actually something that you're familiar with. The select element accepts options and opt groups and magically places them somewhere. And in fact, your browser implements the select element using the same technology. And the technology takes those elements and then places them somewhere. Uh, you can see here you use a CSS selector. Of course, because standards change, that's probably going to be slightly different when it shows up in every browser. Now, if you work on the web, you're probably going to say, I wish this was declarative. Something about this, like there's a lot of JavaScript here, I don't know what's really going on. Uh, well, that's okay, because the template element will allow you to write this declaratively. Who here has used a script element with like a type on it that was like not valid so you could put like funny curly braces and stuff in there? It's like lots of people that work on the web. Uh, please don't do that anymore. Instead, you can use the template element. Our threaded HTML parser in the background can parse it during page load. It's very fast. And then later you can clone the content out of it and stamp it into the page. And this allows you to skip inner HTML. It allows you to pre-allocate the objects. It's, it's quite amazing actually and it's supported in every modern browser now, um, even on iOS, which is great. 
So what's special there? Well, you don't use inner HTML, but there's another feature. The reason why we did crazy hacks with images is because they used to load things. If you've ever used Angular, you have to write ng source. Otherwise, it takes those curly braces in the source attribute and like actually does a request to your server. It's like the first bug everyone has in their Angular application is like, why does my server serve all these 404s for curly braces? And the HTML template element doesn't do that. Everything inside of it is inert. It is actually a template. And finally, we have a packaging story. We have HTML imports. And with HTML imports, you specify a file, and it's just like a regular document. It can contain CSS and JavaScript and markup, and you can bundle your entire widget in there, and then your users just have to import it. And you can have a whole graph of dependencies, and they all get sucked down, and HTTP2 allows the browser to pipeline the connection, so it's actually not as bad as it seems. And that, that seems like it's a lot of stuff. It's like this new framework, but your browser sort of has it. But it's really not bad. In particular, there's frameworks like Polymer, which make this much easier. And so Polymer provides this really sugary sweet declarative API and has polyfills for browsers that don't support some of these new technologies. And it's just elements, though. So Polymer has very little opinion baked in. The idea is that you will use Polymer with some other framework. You will take Angular and you will use Polymer. You will take Ember and you will use Polymer. But Polymer is there just to let you write elements, just like your browser would, so that we can stop rewriting those drop down widgets every time. So, do I have a demo? Yes, it's actually just this slide deck. And if we go look at the slide deck here, we can see it's actually just a bunch of slide elements and a deck. And that's all my slide deck is. And it's very modular. I reuse it between presentations. I just swap in and out the slides. And it works great. And in the future, I might switch it to Angular if Angular 2.0 comes out and I'm like feeling really good about it. Or maybe I'll use React when React has some feature that I want. But it doesn't really matter because my slide deck is just elements. And as far as the framework is concerned, it's like a div or something. So when, when can we use this new technology? Well, it, it's all in Chrome today. Firefox has it behind a flag, which you should be sad about because they haven't shipped it for you yet. Uh, but the spec is changing. Hopefully it's going to ship everywhere, uh, hopefully in Edge eventually, in Safari. And then you'll be able to use it everywhere. And this is really exciting because the power of this is that we stop rewriting these widgets and then we have this really healthy ecosystem of widgets that you can reuse. But the really thing, big thing here is we as browser vendors would like to get out of the business of being arbitrators. Right now you say, I need like a date picker widget, and then you wait years for us to do it. And that's like not functional. And instead, we want to go towards a path where we actually host most of the web platform like in GitHub. It's all web components. It's implemented using the same technology we would have implemented it in had it been in C++, but it's not and then you can just download that standard library and use it yourself. And then you don't have to wait for us to add features to the web anymore. You can do it yourself. And it democratizes this process right now, which is like very political between the browser vendors and is not necessarily serving everyone's best interests. And instead, you can drive the web forward. You don't have to wait for us. And you can help. First, if you see Chrome bugs, please file bugs. Uh, the URL is really short. It's crbug.com. Uh, anytime you see a Chrome bug, like the crash we saw yesterday, or maybe nobody saw, uh, please file a bug about it. Also, make cool apps. Things like Atom are really important to us. When we see cool applications like Famous or Atom or um, what is it? Uh, Flipboard has their like crazy rendering engine thing, which is really cool. Uh, that's amazing for us because it allows us to see like the limits of the platform, and we can like stare at it and figure out how to make the platform faster and better for you. And also, please demand better APIs. I've found it's really fascinating with the web. You talk to people and you see like they wrote this crazy code and you're like, why did you write this crazy code? And they say, because the web didn't do what I wanted. And it's like, please tell us that the web didn't do what you wanted and we will fix it so that you don't have to keep writing this crazy code so that we can make the web better for you, so we can make it more enjoyable. Because we actually do care a lot about developer ergonomics. Is there more extensibility coming? Yes. So let's say we have this page. Historically, what you would have done is you would have added a lot of divs, and then some flexbox, and then some more divs. 
and then even more divs. But we'd really like to stop doing that, and in fact, we're going to give you the ability to hook into the layout system. So in the browser, when you touch off set top, it'll run your code and do a layout. Now this doesn't seem too powerful at first, but it actually allows the browser to batch up all the work, and it also means that all of your components can interoperate. You have this problem in frameworks now where if you run before your framework does its layout, you get the wrong answer. So you have to like time yourself really right. And in the future, that won't be a problem because you'll just hook into the browser. Like you never call get bound and client rect and think like, did the browser lay out yet? Like, of course it has. Also painting. A lot of what people do on the web now is they add like funny little icons and every icon is animated now. Like the play button in YouTube does this like crazy transformation like up into a pause button and everyone has a crazy loader. And we'd really like to open up the painting system on the web so that you can implement that yourself. Now there's Canvas, you can do this, but Canvas isn't really that fast. It's sort of like bolted on the side of the web. And instead, we want to let you hook directly into the rendering pipeline of the browser. And that's where custom painting comes in. Custom painting says, at the paint time in the browser, just call my code. And there's another feature here, if you noticed, these dash dash properties. These dash dash properties are CSS variables or custom properties or whatever the working group has named them today. And they allow you to specify your own CSS values and then use them throughout. And this is actually really powerful and is coming very soon to all browsers. And it'll allow you, for example, in Atom to set colors and configuration options like way in one file and they just get used everywhere. And in the future, you'll be able to build your own systems using those variables. So here's an example. I have this fancy widget that draws something quite fancy and it accepts a radius and a color in these custom properties. And you think, well, I could do this already. But what's really cool here is because it's in the browser as properties, you can animate them too. So you can use CSS animations or web animations to animate the color and the radius property. And just like all other properties in the browser, we will run the animation. So for example here, say I animate the radius from 0 to 20. It'll call your paint code once per frame and you'll see the circle get larger. And we have some demos of this. Uh, it's actually quite cool. So that's web components, and hopefully you have opened up Atom. I'm going to commit the big crime here of trying to do a live demo. This is Atom, and this is the web inspector, which you can bring up with a like, three-finger salute on your keyboard. And what's awesome here is that Atom is actually all web components, and in fact, even the text editor uses Shadow DOM in the same kind of like very modular system. And in fact, I would hope that in the future actually that this Atom text editor, which is just a web component, will be what they use on github.com. Instead of just being in a desktop application, because it should just be this reusable component of web technology. And that's the future, where on your desktop application you have this element. In your framework you have this element and you just use it. So, Thank you for joining me on this tour of web components. And please uh, file bugs again. I also have business cards, like if you don't remember my email address and you would like to file bugs. And let's make the web platform better together. <laughs>